Welcome back. Uh, today we've got a little Winchester shotgun here on the table. This is a, a Winchester model 1897 12 gauge shotgun in the riot configuration. Uh, just John Browning design <clears throat> in uh, all the late 1880s, Browning had invented a lever action shotgun that Winchester was producing called the model 1887. And it was a little cumbersome, a little, uh, uh, probably a little unreliable, I guess. And slide action or pump action shotguns had really, had really started to come on the, on the uh, horizon. So Browning designed a slide action shotgun uh, along this same line that Winchester began producing as a Model 1893. And at the time, the standard 12 gauge shot shell was two and a half inches long and loaded with black powder. But uh, there, there were many other lengths of 12 gauge available. And as they migrated into the smokeless powder age, uh, we got into the two and five eighths inch shell and the uh, two and three quarter inch shell with smokeless powder. And the 1893 action just wasn't, uh, wasn't up to that. So uh, Browning uh, and Winchester changed the design up, changed some dimensions on the receiver, changed the configuration of the ejection port in the receiver, modified the bolt, the length of the receiver, added a cartridge stop, did a few other modifications to the gun, and it became the model 1897, introduced in that year. And it actually stayed in production until 1957, so the production run on this gun was, was 60 years, uh, which is a, a pretty decent run, considering all the other guns that came about during that time uh, the hammerless design. This is an external hammer, an external hammer gun, um, and then Winchester themselves introduced the Model 12 hammerless gun um, in 1912, and then there were myriad other pump action guns, even on into the, the Remington 870, which was introduced prior to this being uh, discontinued in 1957. So it had a good long run. It was available in, in a bunch of different uh, grades, but only two gauges. 12 gauge and 16 gauge. No 20s, no 28s, no 410s, just 12s and 16s. Um, available in standard grade gun, the, the field grade gun, if you will, uh, the brush gun, the riot gun. Then they had the more embellished guns uh, and the trap guns and the premier grade and things of that nature that with engraving and higher grade wood. So this is the riot configuration which was determined by the 20 inch barrel length with the factory cylinder choke. Um, they made a similar gun called the trench gun, which was this basic gun with the addition of a heat shield and a bayonet lug and, and sling swivel uh, that saw use in both World War I and World War II. Two different frame styles in the 1897, the solid frame, which is this gun here, and then a takedown where there was an additional barrel extension uh, and you could actually separate the gun in half right here. The barrel and magazine tube and receiver extension twisted off to provide for easier transportation of the gun. And that's the, the bulk of the Winchester 1897 was produced in the takedown style. They were all solid frames for the first year. They introduced the takedown in 1898 and most produced after that, even though they did produce solid frame guns for quite a few years. Uh, this particular gun 1920. Uh, almost all field guns at that time uh, were takedown, but the riot guns and the trench guns, uh, mainly the riot guns, uh, continued in the solid frame configuration for some years after that. So the riot guns were uh, obviously designed for law enforcement, correctional institutions, things of that nature, and you'll see a lot of them that are marked by uh, whatever agency had them. And the unfortunate thing is, uh, because those tend to bring a little bit more money on the collector market, a lot of those time, a lot of those markings that you see produced on the guns are just not legitimate, they're faked. Uh, these guns are faked, the trench guns are faked even more. Uh, if, and in fact, before you buy what's being purported or being sold to you, as a factory Winchester 97 riot gun. It's a good idea to have someone that is familiar with what the riot gun marking should be or the trench gun marking should be to take a look at it to see if it's, if it's real. 
So this one's real, and we're going to go over in a bit how, how we know that it's real. So um, what we're looking at on these guns, well, first of all, we'll show you the serial number location. On the solid frame guns, the serial number is one spot. It's going to be right here. This E on the top is a series, A, B. They went A through E. But A and B were first year guns. Uh, really by the third year, they were all E series guns. And that was changes to the magazine followers. Minor changes on the inside caused that, that uh, series letter to change. But uh, the, the Winchester serial number uh, was a, a little bit of a controversial thing uh, not too many years ago in determining date of manufacture. So a man by the name of George Mattis some years back uh, had access to the Winchester factory records and he, he wrote books, he did a lot of research in uh, production dates and production uh, specifications and things of that nature on many, many Winchester models, including the 97, uh, although he didn't write too much about that gun in, in, his, in his book. But he used the warehouse records, uh, the date that a certain serial number was received in the warehouse, and that was accepted as a production date of the gun. Since then, the polishing room records uh, were discovered, and those are the records uh, that give the date on which the serial number was applied. And that is uh, considered the, the absolute manufacture date, the correct manufacture date when the serial number is applied. So why does that make a difference? 1919 versus 1920, or 1918 versus 1920, does it make a difference? Probably not. 1898 to 1899 makes a huge difference because 1898 is an antique. Under federal law, 1899 is not. They're valued differently. So uh, there are, sometimes there are several years difference between the polishing room records and the uh, warehouse records uh, in Winchester because these receivers were not assembled and shipped to the warehouse in serial number order. Racks and racks of receivers that had been finished uh, and produced and serial numbers applied and then the workers, the assembly guys would go grab a receiver. They didn't really pay much attention to whether they grabbed the lowest serial number in the rack or not. So there may be, in some cases, a few years difference between when the serial number was applied, when the gun was assembled and sent to warehouse. So now the polishing room records are, are generally accepted as the correct manufacture date and, and that's how we determine whether the gun meets curio and relic status of 50 years or whether it meets antique or not. So uh, unfortunately it's caused a lot of people to really dismiss the rest of the work that George Mattis did because he didn't have the polishing room records but those records were unknown at the time he wrote the book so it's really not his fault. So people that are, are really harsh on George Mattis probably aren't aren't really giving him the benefit of the doubt on that. But anyway, great deal of information. I recommend getting those books and just, if you're interested in these old guns, uh, read the Mattis book, read the stuff that's come out after that. Uh, Bruce Canfield has put out quite a bit of information on the Marshall guns, uh, the, the government issued guns uh, from 1890, of the 1897. They were used in both wars, World War I and II, and hangers on, you know, obviously, between and since. So, there's a ton of good information out there on these guns that uh, is worth reading if you're a aficionado of U.S. military gun. This gun, this particular shotgun, 1920, not a military gun, not a uh, guard gun, not it was a, a commercial uh, shotgun in the right configuration. There are no agency markings of any kind on the gun, just the correct commercial markings. So let's take a look at some of those. How would you know? that this is a, a, a factory riot gun. Or probably the first thing that would differentiate that from a field gun that's been shortened is the choke designation. So the standard configuration of a 12 gauge Winchester 1897 would be a 30 inch barrel in full choke and it would be so marked full there. So obviously if they had cut it with a hacksaw and reset the bead, it would still say full. This one says CYL. So uh, that and the fact that it is 20 inches, the fact that the distance between the muzzle and the front bead is correct uh, for a ride gun. We're in pretty good, uh, pretty good agreement that this is uh, its original configuration would be the ride gun. So we have here on the uh, side of the slide bar 
Uh, there were a few different variations on this marking. This still says model 1897. Again, this comes made in 1920. So very shortly after that, we start seeing, as you say, model 97. Instead of 1897, the story goes that Winchester wanted to modernize the shotgun and not try to make it look so 19th century by getting rid of the 18 there. But uh, in any event, uh, these guns are, again, I mean, they, they've lasted a long time. In fact, they've been copied. The Chinese brought out a copy of this and they were sold and marketed by Norinco and imported into the U.S. and they were popular with the cowboy action guys for a while. But one of the uh, things you hear most about the 1897 is the fact that the gun does not have a disconnector uh, in the action. In other words, the gun will, uh, what they call slam fire. So this is the, uh, this is the, the bolt lock. It's what locks the bolt closed. You can, you can, with the hammer all the way down, you can open. And then if you hold the trigger down, make sure we're open here, the hammer will follow. It's designed to do that. The gun's not broken. Um, it's designed to do that. So you could actually hold the hammer down, work the pump back and forth, and just fire the gun continuously that way as the slam fire. So yeah, it's not necessary to do that, obviously, but um, people like to do it because they like to do it. They've been watching the wild bunch a few too many times. I, I don't know what, <laughs> what the deal is with that. But the Model 12 Winchester, the gun that, that uh, eventually or continued beyond the production date of this gun, uh, the hammerless or the ha hammerless version has an internal hammer, but the uh, Model 12 also doesn't have a disconnector. The Ithaca 37 also doesn't have a disconnector. They'll all do the same thing, but that, uh, that's one of the, the things that people like to talk about with this gun, its ability to slam fire. So the other way to come up with a riot gun is Winchester made a version called the brush gun, the 1897 brush gun. And that was a 26 inch barrel gun with a cylinder bore, but that gun had a shorter stock, a little bit uh, different drop dimensions on the stock. So it's a, a, a very different stock. You can tell by looking at it that it's a, a brush gun and, and not a, a riot gun. So uh, if, they, if you were to take a brush gun and cut it, uh, it would obviously still say cylinder on it. But I don't know too many people faking a completely commercial riot gun. There's really no reason to do that. Uh, if they were going to make a riot gun, they would also, they, if they were going to take the time to fake a riot gun, they would put some kind of government issue markings on that. And, uh, or Wells Fargo. I mean, uh, there are so many fake Wells Fargo guns out there, particularly the older guns, the Winchester and whatnot. But sometimes you see double barrel guns and, and sometimes these Pump 97s with uh, fake Wells Fargo markings on them. So. Uh, buyer beware on those for sure. So other than that, uh, when you're evaluating a 97, it's the same thing that we talk about when we talk about valuing any of these older guns. It's originality, scarcity, and condition, right? So this gun, we believe, is 100% original. We Again, we go over the markings with uh, magnification under good light. So all of these patent markings are correct for the 1920 date, so we believe the, the barrel is original. After about 1920, barrels are dated on the underneath. This one is not. Uh, but that, that is appropriate for a 1920 gun also. But the markings are too clear. It's not been polished. It's rust blue, just like it should be. Um, we have a little crack here on the forend, but it's still solid. We haven't had any finish added to it. These guns weren't checkered. Though we haven't had any finish added to it that we can tell. This butt plate is correct. This was a composition butt plate or a hard rubber butt plate is correct for 1920 with the correct logo on the bottom of it. So that hasn't been replaced either. So uh, we have a pretty good idea that this is as it came from the Winchester factory in 1920. The bore on this particular gun is actually very nice. The mechanics are actually very nice. There's a ton of moving parts in this and most of them show. When you operate the action, the carry and all that drops out the bottom. So, you can take a good look at all that, make sure everything is there. Uh, the extractor and ejectors work fine. Um, so, 
uh, originality we're okay with, condition we're okay with, and we'll talk about scarcity. 1897s, there were a lot of them. They made uh, around a million of them, or maybe just a little under a million. They were, they were serialized sequentially with the 1893, so right out a maybe 960,000 of the 1897s were made before they were discontinued, so there's quite a few still out there. Uh, the most common one you're gonna see is the 12 gauge 30 inch gun full choke. They, they were available on order with longer barrels, shorter barrels, and anytime you get a Winchester that is other than the standard configuration, it's a good idea to uh, try to uh, determine whether it, it came from the factory that way. And the records on these are available uh, from the uh, Buffalo Bill Museum in Cody, Wyoming. You can get a factory letter on pretty much how the gun, to a degree at least, how the gun left the factory and what configuration it is. So sometimes more information, sometimes less information. It comes from the warehouse ledgers uh, and you'll have the polishing room date of serial application to the receiver on that factory letter. So it's a, if you get one of these older guns, it's a good idea to, uh, to get that factory letter if there's any doubt. And if it's a rare gun, or especially if it's a higher grade gun, it may have some factory engraving on it, it's a must to get that letter because that's going to add provenance to the gun and, and help solidify the collector value of the gun. The prices aren't going down on these, they don't make them anymore. Uh, Winchester collecting is always one of the blue chip uh, collector guns, Winchester Colt, uh, are probably the top two collected guns. So. The 97 uh, is, or the 1897 Winchester is an important gun in uh, both Browning history, Winchester history, uh, martial history, military gun history, if you're into that, or even if you collect uh, prison stuff, law enforcement stuff, the 97s are, are an important part of that too. So a cool gun that came through the range. Um, we were fortunate and able to pick it up as part of a small collection. And we're going to continue to bring these this type of stuff to you uh, as we can, as we as we can get a hold of it and, and uh, do a little research on it and talk about it. And if you have any questions, please drop them in the comments. Uh, if there's a particular make and model that you'd like to see us go over, please drop that in the comments as well. We'll get to it uh, as we can. We certainly will, uh, assuming we can get a hold of it. So uh, that said, please like and subscribe to the channel. We appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to look at it and listen to me babble on about it. Sometimes I get off in the weeds, but try not to. But uh, anyway, have a good day and we'll see you next time around. Thanks a lot.